Okay, welcome everyone to this monthly Susanna webinar. Uh, the topic today is multi-sectoral actions for water sanitation and hygiene, the theoretical versus the practical. Uh, the webinar today is hosted by the Stockholm Environment Institute and Susanna, the uh, Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. And this is through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we'll have three presentations today, um, starting with Nicholas Villamino, Senior WASH Technical Advisor with Action Against Hunger, Yovana Dodos, Public Health Consultant, Action Against Hunger, and Peter Hines, Baby WASH Coalition Coordinator from World Vision. And during the presentations today, I encourage you to think about some questions you might want to ask, and also about your own experiences so that you can share those. Um, towards the end when we'll have about 15 minutes for discussion. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nicholas, who is going to start today. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Um, so on the behalf of the Baby Wash Coalition, I will start this presentation by explaining a bit uh, how we went through a number of uh, definitions for uh, what we mean by integration and what, what we wanted to, to, to discuss today. I'm going to present a few definitions about integration on behalf of the Baby Wash Coalition. Um, we created a number of uh, working groups with the, the, the coalition, grouping a few organizations um, under the uh, leadership of World Vision and Water Aid. Um, and on behalf of the coalition uh, representing Action Against Hunger, we worked uh, on trying to first explain what we mean by, this, by integration so that we can move on to uh, having more concrete examples. So we, we agreed uh, with, uh, for, for definition, uh, that integration is defined as a continuum uh, that requires the coordination of different technical sectors to ensure the coherence uh, and minimize the duplication of sectors, at least the very minimum is that they don't work against each other. Uh, the rest of the continuum that I will describe in a minute uh, is to make sure that we have the different phases and reaching, at best, a synergy of sectoral interventions that are totally designed and, and, and implemented uh, using the same strategy, using the same resources, the competencies are being shared at every step of the project. The um, Baby Wash Coalition uh, is focusing specifically on four technical sectors. The wash, obviously, for the baby wash, but as well the maternal, newborn, and child health, MNTH, the nutrition and health, and the early child development, ET. And so the integration for the Baby Wash Coalition that we are discussing from today is uh, to make sure two or more of those technical sectors intentionally work together to address the needs of children between, uh, I mean, the first thousand days of life, actually, so from pregnancy to the age of two, uh, the 1,000-day window of opportunity, with a common goal to improve the quality of life of children and mothers. So we created this definition of integration to agree on uh, it was about integration of technical sectors. We had different discussions of how far do we want to talk about integration, is it integration in the uh, public services, uh, integration of the different uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene. We've agreed that what we meant for this coalition for integration is about the integration of two of those of those two or more of those uh, four technical sectors. Uh, we use a number of uh, different ways of thinking. Uh, many things are out around there about integration. In action against hunger has different ones. Wash Plus has also discussed about integration. Uh, the Spring has also some publications. Uh, on our side of action against hunger, we even had uh, 90 pages report uh, back in the, the 2008 or 9 discussing about integration. So there's a lot, a lot of different debates, and so that's why we had to really come up with one definition so that we can agree together on what are the different steps that we can work on. So we have agreed uh, on, on this definition that I mentioned and uh, about this continuum idea. So what we will 
like to discuss with you is about how integration can happen along these four different uh, levels. The first one, is the, the most common easy one, is the collocation. That will be the step one of integration. Then the second step is coordination. The third one will be collaboration and then synergy. Step number one, collocation. What do we mean by collocation? So that's when programs are implemented in the same place uh, with the same target audiences, the same communities, uh, and that although it's not a coordinated program, it is, there, there is an assumption that there's a coherence in the different actions that are being done. So same geographical location and same target name of community. Step two, coordination. Okay. So co coordination, uh, program elements or the messages in uh, the different parts of the project are coordinated and harmonized differently between the different sectors. We expect that there is a shared information between the sectors, that there's a limitation of duplication, and that we facilitate learning from one another. But with a coordinated approach, uh, the activities are still separate. Collaboration will be when the teams, especially, come to work together on joint activities uh, with a specific common goal. That's the importance of having a common goal. And uh, having sectoral activities that are chosen and prioritized to have the highest impact on that common goal. So the workers, the, the field teams, uh, will receive training from the other sectors. The WASH person will be trained in nutrition. Uh, they can su support multi-sector collaboration and referrals and these kind of, of different actions to achieve uh, the highest outcome. And then finally, uh, the synergy is when we really have a program that is defined with all these elements put together. The field workers are expected to deliver not just one sector, but several sectors, apart from different sectors. Uh, you need to have a unified strategy, you need to share the resources, and the competencies will be maximized so that people are not just a WASH technician or a nutrition uh, officer, but that they're able to do different parts of the program at the same time in the same places. And importantly, it is uh, a joint monitoring and evaluation framework uh, to be able to measure together the achievement towards the overarching goal um, and an improvement of the thousand window, uh, the thousand days window of opportunity. So I'm just putting back the, the definitions that I just discussed here, and I will pass it on to uh, my colleagues for the rest of the discussion. Uh, for those of you who joined later, I would just like to briefly uh, present myself. My name is uh, Jovana Dodosh. I'm currently working as a public health consultant for Action Against Hunger in France. I'm also the author of uh, Wash Nutrition Practical Guidebook that I'm going to talk about today as a part of uh, my presentation. So this presentation is uh, going to cover four main points. I'm going to start by introducing to you the new Action Against Hunger, UNICEF, and ECHO, Wash Nutrition Practical Guidebook. I'm going to briefly present you the content of, uh, of this guidebook. Then I'm going to talk about some examples of uh, good practice in WASH and nutrition integration. And finally, I'm going to wrap up and finish by discussing some challenges for successful integration. So. What is this publication about, why it was developed, and for whom? Wash Nutrition is a practical guidebook on increasing nutritional impact through integration of uh, Wash Nutrition programs. This publication actually demonstrates the importance of both. On one hand, supplementing nutrition programs with Wash activities. On the other hand, adapting Wash interventions to include nutritional consideration, or in other words, making them more nutrition sensitive. It has been developed uh, to respond to the growing need for more practical guidance on wash nutrition integration at the field level, and to provide practitioners with the suitable information and tools 
so they can design, implement, evaluate, monitor effective washer nutrition programs. The primary target group of this publication are field practitioners working in humanitarian and development context, but it can also be used as a practical tool for donors, policymakers, institutions such as Ministry of Health to prioritize strategic activities and funding options. Uh, development of the WASH Nutrition Practical Guidebook was uh, financially supported by European Union Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection, or widely known as DG ECHO. In addition to that, around uh, 20 organizations contributed to its development, either by peer reviewing the content or uh, sharing the best, uh, the best practices. And here I highlighted the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. I want to say that uh, we used Susana platform to launch the call for contributions, and this proved to be a very good way to reach uh, interested uh, stakeholders and collect various, very different best practices uh, from around the world. Briefly about the content uh, of, uh, of the guidebook, this guidebook is organized in uh, six chapters. It also has a programmatic uh, resource section. You can find a number of notes, uh, boxes with tips, further comments, link to web pages, suggested readings throughout the manual, as well as practical examples from the field or the case studies that have been collected from Action Against Hunger Missions and the contributors. Now I would like to uh, briefly guide you through these uh, six chapters so you can get a better idea what is this publication about and what you can actually uh, get from it. So the chapter one outlines uh, the basics of uh, undernutrition and provides a short overview of the key concepts that are relevant for washing nutrition integrated programming, such as definition of nutrition security, the role of WASH in ensuring nutrition security, characteristics of nutrition sensitive interventions, 1000 days window of opportunity, etc. Chapter two provides a rationale behind linking nutritional status with WASH environment and explains how WASH interventions by preventing infection and disease actually help reduce undernutrition. Chapter 3 is organized around uh, five pillars of uh, WASH nutrition strategy. It gives uh, operational guidance and advice and basically answers the question how to integrate WASH and nutrition interventions at the field level. It also highlights possible challenges and proposes strategies for, for overcoming them. Chapter 4 describes the practical implementation of, uh, of integrated activities at the different levels, starting from household level, community, national level, in different settings, such as health and nutrition centers, schools. Special attention under this chapter is given to integrating WASH nutrition interventions in emergency contexts. Chapter 5 proposes a framework for monitoring and evaluation of integrated activities and also offers a set of indicators that could be used to measure progress and impact. Finally, Chapter 6 uh, covers advocacy for wash nutrition integration, communication, capacity building for project staff, as well as operational research on the subject. That was briefly about, uh, about, the, about the six chapters. I would just like to mention also the programmatic resource section that you can find, uh, that you can find in this practical guidebook. This uh, resource section is a collection of practical tools and examples from the field project that could be used uh, by the practitioners to help integration efforts at each phase of a classic project management cycle. That means that in this uh, resource section, you can find uh, examples of integrated seasonal calendars, examples of WASH nutrition strategic mapping, examples of WASH nutrition project problem tree, examples of logical framework analysis, budgets, organigrams, timeframes, all you need for, for successful integrated programming. This was about the guidebook. Now I would like to talk about some uh, success stories in, uh, in WASH nutrition integration and to highlight that uh, our practical guidebook offers around 20 examples of integrated programming 
that illustrate how the integration Nicholas was talking about and I'm talking about today actually works in practice. I will briefly present you two examples from uh, Action Against Hunger Mission that I visited as a part of a data collection for this uh, practical guidebook. So the first uh, success story comes from uh, development context. Uh, this is a project in Afghanistan, sorry, in uh, Senegal that aims at uh, strengthening the prevention and management of uh, severe acute malnutrition cases or STEM cases through an integrated approach. Within the framework of this project, uh, special attention is given to the implementation of a 1,000 day strategy and targeting pregnant uh, lactating women and uh, children under the age of two. So why this story from uh, Senegal is a success story? Because uh, here we can find an example of uh, integration that uh, goes uh, both ways. On one hand, main hygiene promotion efforts are designed around nutrition activities and uh, they are jointly implemented at the community level and at the level of uh, health cost. For instance, uh, one of these nutrition activities was a demonstration of food preparation for improved nutrition. And for this specific activity, WASH, uh, WASH project staff ensured that uh, demonstration sites for food preparation have uh, safe drinking water that is stored in clean containers as well as hand washing stations uh, with water and soap. These demonstrations always uh, began with the staff washing their hands in front of the practitioners and participants. On the other hand, nutrition activities which were focused on improving young child feeding practices included several wash awareness rising components such as hand washing at critical moments, proper use of latrine, safe drinking water consumption, hygiene of a newborn, clean and healthy living environments, use of mosquito nets, and etc. What can we see here is that both sectors, wash and nutrition sector, actually broke the silos and ensured that issues and objectives of one sector are properly taken into account by another. The second success story I would like to talk about today comes from an emergency context and it's about an integrated health, nutrition and uh, WASH project uh, in Afghanistan, Gore province. Uh, various interventions uh, were proposed and are currently being uh, under the implementation uh, uh, under this project, such as mass screening, uh, provision of uh, severe acute malnutrition or some outpatient treatment, support to the inpatient treatment in provincial hospital, these nutrition activities are combined or supplemented by various WASH interventions, such as distribution of chlorine aquatabs to the beneficiaries with no access uh, to protected water sources, rehabilitation of non-functional wells, distribution of biosand filters to the beneficiaries fetching water from the river. And I would like to point out one specific intervention, which is the hygiene promotion with the awareness rising on the key nutrition messages at the village level. So the question is, what kind of nutrition messages can be actually integrated into hygiene promotion? To give you an example, uh, promotion of uh, exclusive uh, breastfeeding during the first uh, six months of life has the potential to reduce the risk uh, of infection from contaminated water and food sources and actually presents an example of nutrition messages that could be easily included into, into hygiene promotion. For this uh, specific project uh, in Afghanistan, WASH uh, project uh, staff was uh, trained to identify and refer cases of uh, severe acute malnutrition during the delivery of, uh, of WASH interventions in the communities. Now the question is, uh, what made uh, these uh, interventions work? Or what were the success factors that, uh, that made uh, these integration efforts work? So I'm going to name a few that were identified uh, during the data collection for this uh, practical guidebook. In many of these uh, case studies, we found that uh, WASH and nutrition sectors managed to identify uh, some areas of common interest, such as 1,000 days with of opportunity. There were also some uh, joint situation analysis, meaning that WASH and nutrition sector uh, conducted uh, integrated assessment and had the joint planning. 
Also, one or more indicators were incorporated into the project objectives of another sector, or there was a common specific objective for, for both sectors. In other words, uh, a logical framework for uh, some of these integrated projects had a shared purpose that was measured by indicators relating to its uh, specific aspects. For example, uh, I'll just give you an example of some indicators. Prevalence of uh, stunting or wasting among children under five, or proportion of households keeping uh, clean areas where children's food is prepared and served. Some of uh, other success factors are definitely joint uh, synchronized delivery of uh, interventions in the same uh, geographical area, targeting the same beneficiaries, uh, regular and significant communication between WASH and nutrition actors, as well as well-coordinated management and reporting structure, and finally, joint monitoring and evaluation of, uh, of integrated activities. So, while we know that uh, there is a relationship between WASH and nutrition and the effects uh, of WASH and nutrition are recognized and acknowledged. Numerous difficulties are still there in implementing these uh, integrated, uh, integrated programs. In other words, unless uh, we have a WASH or nutrition indicator that is included in project objectives, uh, there is a little incentive uh, to work uh, towards, towards an integrated goal. And uh, I would like to finish now just by briefly discussing some, uh, some challenges uh, for successful integration that, that we identified. Of course, we, we should always start by, by funding. Funding is often uh, intended uh, for a single purpose, such as wash or nutrition, but not for both. And big challenge are restrictions on what funding can be used for, actually. These type of restrictions do not allow nutrition programs to incorporate uh, WASH activities and uh, vice versa. Uh, most of the times, uh, pilot funding received for integrated uh, projects is not enough to show an impact or to take uh, programs uh, to the scale. Uh, barrier to successful integration at the field level is definitely lack of uh, regular communication, discussions, meetings between WASH and nutrition sectors, so sectors are still working in silos and are unable to look at them at the bigger picture. There is a limited uh, evidence available on the effectiveness and here I primarily refer to cost effectiveness of uh, multi-sectoral approaches on nutrition and we definitely need uh, more examples of uh, successfully integrated programs uh, that would guide design in, in implementation of, uh, of new projects. And uh, each sector, WASH and nutrition sector, is still uh, in process of learning about its own uh, most strategic interventions, and therefore it is difficult to prioritize integrated interventions and decide with the limited time and resources which activities have the most impact. Knowledge on integrating programs is a challenge in addition to, to the lack of training. And here I would like to finish by thanking you for, for your attention. I hope uh, you will enjoy the reading of our new WASH Nutrition Practical Guidebook. I remain at uh, your disposal for, for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. And I know there's some questions coming in in the chat. I think we will go on to Peter, and then we'll have some time afterwards to discuss any questions that come up together. Um, so hopefully um, a lot of the themes that have been touched on already by both Nicholas and Giovanna you'll see um, come out in, in this presentation as well. Um, I'll put a, a caveat over the top in that um, World Vision is, is trying to figure this out and we're doing it imperfectly, um, but we're excited to share um, where we've been going and hopefully at the end hear some exciting things that you've been doing um, to, to learn from each other. And so that's kind of uh, the heart this presentation is coming from. And so you'll see here, um, as we've already talked about, the, the baby wash concept. Um, and so we at World Vision are very excited about the baby wash coalition. Um, and so that's where our uh, internal work is, is coming from um, and where we're excited to be with partners who think this integration piece in the first thousand days is just as important. And so like Nicholas talked about in the beginning, uh, specifically we're talking about wash, health, nutrition, and 
education, but especially in that first thousand days, so the early childhood development uh, integration of sectors. And so we've discovered um, that as we've been trying to roll out more integrated programs that, uh, like Giovanna was talking about, one of the main challenges is um, staff capacity, interest, focus, right, that everything is so vertical that it's hard to be able to, to branch out to look at other sectors or other multi-sectoral action that could potentially happen. And so we've had some success um, around explaining these two concepts to people. So the first is environmental enteric dysfunction, um, which as we see really brings together the WASH, ECD, and nutrition communities in the first thousand days of the household. Uh, and then as well as talking about sepsis at the health facility during birth. And so clear, clearly that brings together the health piece and the WASH piece. Uh, but also maybe some nutrition pieces with immediate breastfeeding and things like that. And so uh, thanks to our friends over at Deceit DD, um, which is a, a branch of PATH, um, they have some great infographic stuff around EED and so, or environmental enteropathy, EE, same, same thing, different name, uh, that we've been able to share with our field staff. And so recently we, we went to um, our program in Uganda to try to if we can bring sectors together and start to think through multi-sectoral actions and by explaining what is EED and how the sectors impact that, that's been really helpful. Um, we've been on the lookout for a similar type infographic for sepsis, uh, specifically how water and sanitation leads towards sepsis in delivery and birth for pregnant women and for mothers and newborns. Um, haven't found anything that we've loved, so if you do know of anything, uh, please do let us know. We think that something uh, simple and geared towards someone outside the sector is going to be key to encouraging multi-sectoral action and to allowing practitioners to grasp the links between these different sectors. And so um, our goal really at this point um, is as you think about the continuum that Nicholas shared, those definitions that the coalition came up with, um, moving along into the coordination collaboration section. Um, we would love at the end of the day to be able to have a full-fledged grant with partners that includes all sectors uh, in the first thousand days and have a really synergistic approach to integration. Um, in in our view, that hasn't been possible yet without a major funder to come on board to help with that. And so while we're trying to utilize the funds we currently have and to move in that direction, it's a little more of a piecemeal operation. So we think we can get to the coordination collaboration side with an ultimate hope of going farther to synergy which that's part of the reason, one of the many reasons why we're so excited about the Baby Wash Coalition to continue with um, group advocacy with multiple coalitions to be able to start to shout this message from the hilltops and see if we can A, gather more evidence for integration and B, get some brave funders to come on board to work with some of our organizations to help get the full picture of synergy that we're looking for. So, in the meantime, while we're trying to move toward that collaboration coordination side of things, um, we've put together a really brief um, roadmap for how our teams might be able to start to move in that direction. And so I know what's on the screen is a little bit small, um, but it goes through four different key phases. And our mantra is that for every national office we have, every country office we use, um, the process will be a little bit different. And so we're encouraging offices to take this, change it as they need it, and run with it. And so you can see there we've split it up into four Ps. Um, we were originally calling it the P4, but we backed off that a little bit. So um, the prepare stage, so how do you actually prepare for planning of multi-sectoral actions, right? Prioritizing what are the things that we need to accomplish, 
planning for actual implementation and then actually performing that implementation. And so you'll see there there are subsections to each of those. Um, the tool we have, I'll call it, um, only gives really brief guidance to all of those things. Uh, World Vision has been working on a, a matching toolkit that goes hand in hand with this. Um, we are hoping this is a little bit more actionable for field staff um, who might not be able to get through the whole the whole toolkit that we have. And so I just wanted to briefly talk about how we're thinking about each step and what we are thinking the most important parts are, um, and then then wrap up and, and hopefully hear some thoughts from all of you. So in this prepare section, um, to me the two most important steps are the forming of the work group and the gathering of any research that's already happened. And so from our perspective, it's really key that in that work group, you have technical specialists from all four areas. And we found that as we've been trying to make these working groups, the ECD specialist um, has been the hardest to get at, mostly because our World Vision programming mostly focuses on three and up, and the under two is, is a newer uh, area for us. And so we've been, when we were in Uganda, we were looking towards government officials and other NGOs in the area that might be able to come alongside us and help boost that area and boost that expertise for us. Um, you'll also see in that, that key members of the working group, your national level leadership, so at, at our World Vision structure is a, a national office and then um, um, area program offices in the country, and so if we're going to allow staff to spend time on thinking through multi-sectoral actions. They have to have buy-in from their higher-ups. And so that's why they're on that team, um, as well as grants or partnership leads. So as we think through how can we be writing this multi-sectoral nature into grants we have, how can we be bringing in partners, how can we be working in consortium with other organizations, that's all really important for that working group in the prepare stage. Um, and then step two there is gathering any research that's already been collected. And so our Uganda teams had done a wash and healthcare facility survey, which was showed really good data that we could say here are the gaps that we're looking at. And then they had some environmental health checklists for communities, which starts getting at that EED idea around what's a clean environment for children. Um, needed some improvement there, but with at least some baseline data that we could use to start thinking through multi-sectoral action. So once you've kind of gotten that and made the ground more fertile for coming together and talking um, and using that research, the key is to prioritize. So for those of you on the call who have kind of been with us for a while through this World Vision process. Uh, a while ago, we had um, presented a 737 intervention guideline. Um, we still like that, but we think that is a little bit too complicated um, or at least too big to be able to start grasping at what are some key multi-sectoral actions that we can have. So we've simplified that to a 223. You can see we love our numbers. Um, and thinking through, if you look, focus specifically on sepsis and EED here. And so during pregnancy, preparing the household to um, think through what is a clean environment for children, what would be a clean birth environment. Um, and then as you get to the facility, the WHO 6 clean, thinking about sepsis. And then finally, once the new child is around, we thought about some key hot spots around that first month of life, when they start crawling and putting stuff in their mouth, and when they start complementary feeding, uh, that's when your hygienic environment is key. And so in this prioritized stage, you have your working group sit down and kind of look and say, okay, what area of our country do we have multiple programs running that have some of these pieces in them already that we can try to strengthen and look for how do we actually operationalize this and work together. So that leads towards your planning stage where you actually sit down in an area. Um, so you would need to bring in the people who are actually implementing on the ground in that place and think through what are some key multi-sectoral actions. 
And so this has really helped us to think through it. Um, if you think through the four different sectors that we've called out that are key to baby wash, um, that red overlap section are the things that each sector is doing that they can strengthen with a baby wash lens for a focus on those first thousand days. So for instance, um, for the wash sector, right, there's already great things going on um, in most of our organizations with CLTS and um, ODF communities. Is there a way to strengthen that um, thinking linking it specifically to EED and how um, children need a sanitary environment or is going to help their health, um, and specifically looking at those under twos. So focusing that area and strengthening the, the baby wash idea. Um, maternal child health, thinking about delivery rooms, what is the water situation like in delivery rooms. Um, bringing it to that level. And so if you start there, what are we currently doing that we can strengthen, then you can say, okay, we're actually working towards similar goals here. Um, is there an overarching goal that we're going to that we can measure together? And then are there missing gaps um, that we need to create new multi-sectoral interventions for? The hope is that this framework is not going to cause a large influx of additional money because we don't necessarily have that to provide at this point. Um, and so hopefully programs that we're running um, can tailor what they're already doing or with a minimal amount of money add on an additional activity or something like that. And different organizations have different funding structures, so this might not work for everyone, um, but we're hoping that this might be a good, a good model for us in World Vision. And then you actually do the implementation. And so the, the key things I wanted to highlight, which gets back to, to Giovanna's challenges slide, um, is to think through these three things. So operational research around what does a clean space space actually look like? Um, that intervention has traditionally fallen sort of between the WASH and the education sectors. Um, sometimes one or the other has picked it up. But can we do some research um, or connect with the SHINE trials or things like that that are doing um, some good thinking about this to understand in a development or emergency context in your country what is the best way to keep children from a contaminated environment that might lead to EED. Um, and then I've, I've called academic studies here where if funding is available to actually do some research on these integrated programs to show that multi-sectoral action and working together has an economic benefit like Giovanna was talking about or a health impact that then we can use to encourage funders to come on board and move towards that synergy side of the continuum. Um, and then key obviously is as we, as we do these actions to communicate um, successes and challenges to be able to, to grow the excitement for this integrated possibility. So I just threw on the end here some next steps for us um, at World Vision, um, where we're cruising towards finalizing these tools for, for ourselves and rolling them out. And so i um, happy to share drafts we have. And hopefully, if anyone has, has thought to include anything that you guys have. Um, but then also just staying really connected with what everyone else is doing, um, any information coming out of the Baby Wash Coalition, that where we can work together, where organizations can come together for practical multi-sectoral actions to help move the sector in that direction. Um, and I feel like, this is a little bit of a aside, um, but I just feel like it's very important for, for me coming from more of a wash side and maybe for a lot of us on the call coming from more of a wash side, um, that a lot of what we can do in the sector um, we could do by ourselves, right? We can um, work in communities for cleaner communities and we can um, help work with health facilities to provide clean water and things like that or um, advocate with governments to help them to do that. But it is key to bring in these other sectors to figure out what's the best considerations for um, whatever we're doing. And so sometimes I feel like um, health and ECD have had to be more intersectoral just by nature, and so they are um, sometimes think more towards that direction than WASH practitioners do. That might be my own personal anecdote, but that's how I how I feel. 
sometimes. So I think it is um, upon us to really champion this idea and to trumpet this idea of, of multi-sectoral key action. So anyway, that's what I've got. Um, I know we have some questions for, for Giovanna on the toolkit, and anything that any of you can share around um, successes or challenges you've had with practical integration, would love to hear it more about. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, like Peter just said, uh, maybe we can open the discussion with any examples that anyone who's listening to the webinar presentations today would like to share from their own experience. And um, you can use your microphone. You can turn it on. You have the microphone rights now. And um, if you'd like to, to make a comment, um, you can put up your hand at the top. There's a button with hand up. Um, just to get the discussion started, I'll start with a question um, we've seen here from Alexander, who was asking how the beneficiaries themselves assess this type of integration. And that can be for all of you. Yeah, I can start on that. Um, and so the one of the keys that World Vision was thinking about in Uganda, um, which is our, our newest foray, so still in process, um, but is um, to, to use some operational research to help um, talk to communities and to help not only our staff, but community members understand these linkages between sectors, and so they can help us to determine what are the best behaviors or the best routes to help through multi-sectoral action. And so I think you're totally right that in every context um, and every community, the right multi-sectoral actions, quote unquote, correct, um, or the way to go about this will be really different. And so it is key to be able to use our connections with what government is doing and use our connections with communities to be able to prioritize what to educate community members and then prioritize what they discover and what they create outside of that education. And adding on that, um, I think it's <coughs> excellent questions from, from Alexander. There's quite a, a few of them, so I would like to hear his thoughts uh, maybe after. But uh, I think it's, it's very important that um, we're talking about the different levels from government, community, uh, household level and then individual levels and uh, key steps of behavior change are, are, are uh, very important to the baby wash. We're using uh, in many of the sectors the same uh, channels to communicate to people but have mixed messages often. Uh, we're using the same community volunteers um, so it's very important that we engage at the right level and that we maximize um, the requests from people to to have similar outcomes. And it's very, usually the demand is there from, from mothers uh, that want to have uh, healthy children. That's a goal that is across uh, every culture and every country. And there is definitely a request from beneficiaries and from populations to know how to do it and how to increase it. Um, then we're providing some of the tools to different uh, ways with this kind of guidance. Alexander also had a, a, a great uh, point about uh, the need to start integration with uh, training of uh, staff and training of trainers, uh, which I think is a very, very interesting point. Uh, he was asking if, if in the Action Against Hunger Manual there was uh, such guidance. It is not. I mean, there is already quite a lot of that manual, so we couldn't include everything. But definitely in what Peter has been, has been discussing, there's a lot of, of this, of raising awareness, building capacities of staff, and running the, 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 the training tools. And I think this is a very, very important point um, that I wanted to emphasize here. Just, just briefly on the, on the role of the beneficiaries and maybe point of view of the beneficiaries regarding the, the integration, uh, here is important to emphasize that there are no concrete uh, studies or clear evidence showing that uh, beneficiaries prefer a more or less integrated approach. I can just mention some examples from the field that we received as a contribution uh, for, this, uh, for this manual. Uh, uh, several of them were quite positive regarding the integration, for example, of wash and nutrition awareness rising activities uh, because 
participation of mothers, who are most of the time uh, the key target group, uh, in this kind of workshop or awareness rising activities or demonstration requires time, so it is time consuming, and for them it's much more convenient to attend once instead of twice uh, two different uh, awareness rising uh, sessions. So for example, um, in Senegal, what we found is that uh, when um, hygiene promoters combined nutrition messages and, uh, and vice versa and tried to simplify them instead of multiplying messages that, are, that were coming from different sources, uh, effect, were, uh, effect was bigger and basically much, uh, much, uh, uh, it was much more impact, impact, impactful on what we wanted to, to find and do. Thank you. Are there other questions from participants today? If you can uh, use your mic, you can ask directly or you can put them in the chat and I will moderate the questions. I have a question about whether you think that the focus on integration within the SDG agenda has um, been increasing the interest in this kind of approach. If you've seen that um, among your partners or among funders. I, I would say yes. Um, I think the challenge with um, multi-sectoral action and SDG 17 around partnerships and things like that is it can get really fuzzy and, and not concrete. Um, and especially when we're talking about um, our uh, field staff who are so busy implementing programs and responsible for grant timelines and things like that, to, to think through a more I'll call it fuzzy, but less defined way of working um, can be very difficult. And But on the other hand, because multi-sectoral action is going to be different in every context, we can't over-prescribe that will look like. So we've been struggling with what is the middle ground of not being overly prescriptive, but having enough guidance to help people actually do this in the limited time frame they have. And so I think more people are thinking about it, but I think it can become a frustration point if there's not um, good guidance out there. So the, the ACF guidebook is a great way to start to move in that direction to help people to, to understand what this might look like. Yeah, and I, I think I mean, there's definitely a strong interest. It's been, it's been around for some time, but more and more uh, the integration and multi-sector approaches are being promoted by, by both donors and the, the, the implementing organizations. Uh, what's missing is, is, is uh, as Giovanna was saying, evidence uh, on a, one aspect, um, the economy of it, is it really worth it? Uh, that's probably an easy one. And then good tools and good practices. So that's what we're trying to do with the coalition, as Peter was, was mentioning. Uh, we are working, we have like this working group working on two, on two aspects. One is on program implementation, and we are asking around if people have good examples or bad examples, because it's also interesting to see what hasn't worked, um, and having a call for case studies. The other aspect of, of what we're doing is to try to advocate for this integration and for uh, multi-sector uh, programming and, and, and funding. And I think that all this work has generated some results already by reaching the SDGs. So it was already something that started before the, 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 the UASH coalition and before uh, we, we started discussing about it, and that was already quite a good result that we all have as a community. Now we need to actually make it happen and demonstrate that it works. Are there any further questions anyone would like to? Yeah, well, this is Frank. Frank Fashenda from Concern Worldwide. Hi, everybody. Um, just, uh, just wanted to discuss one common limitation that we are facing in uh, our wash and nutrition integrated program uh, at the moment, uh, which is the fact that for integrating the, the, the wash and uh, the wash and the page around hand washing and the other topics that you have described, uh, we are often uh, relying on existing health or nutrition community network. And the problem that we are facing is that uh, this, this type of networks are voluntary based and they have already, of course, a lot of uh, health and nutrition uh, behaviors to discuss about with the community. So we, we, we are just worried, basically, that it might lead uh, 
as some assessments have already shown, uh, on the knowledge via the gap that won't really trigger uh, adoption of uh, new uh, new practices with regard to what I just wanted to share these limitations, and I don't know if anybody gets any some ideas about how to answer this limitation. Yeah, um, it is. We're very aware that often our um, community health workers or whatever volunteer you're working with are already strapped with what they're doing, right? They already have a full slate of messages, and it's really hard to add something additional on. And so the way we've been trying to work through that is um, adding more intersectoral language or baby wash lens things into what they're already doing. So if they're, you know, our TTC advisors or um, if they're running a specific curriculum to add a smaller section around that. So it's not an additional thing they have to do. It might lengthen a, a particular session by a tiny bit. Um, the other thing we thought through is that when we were in Uganda trying to bring these sectors together, we really said, okay, WASH, you need to lead on this because the health team has no capacity and no additional funding to do this piece. And so if this multi-sectoral action is going to happen, you need to get input and feedback from your health colleague, but you need to be able to, you have the flexibility to be able to put this into your program. And so the benefit is if you have four sectors working, you might be able to arrange it so that the sector that has the ability can take it on. Um, but like we all know, if it's everyone's problem, it's no one's problem, right? So you have to have a really solid team to get that um, to actually happen and move forward. Did Giovanna or Nicholas want to comment any further on that? Uh, I can just yes say a word. I think it's an excellent point. Um, and yeah, we definitely agree that we have limitations uh, at many many points, especially with, with uh, community volunteers um, <coughs> and how they're being managed and, and what capacities they have. Uh, but I think it's also an interesting point to identify, to be able to identify what the gaps are and what uh, one side is not able to do and try to see if there are other aspects. Uh, doing the diagnosis and the assessment of uh, existing gaps on the community volunteers may allow us to generate a program on behavior change for uh, another WASH aspect, for example. Uh, so definitely it's a challenge uh, and often they're working in very similar context uh, to the, the, and, and time frame as, as uh, Frank. Uh, we have that pressure on, on time and donors, uh, but on the biggest scheme of things, I think we also can take that as a chance to really try to redefine and add different components and convince people that it's necessary to have not just our current programming working inside or with the community health workers, but maybe we need to add an entrepreneur side, maybe we need to add a bigger like, communication level, we need to have like a, a policy and education at uh, national levels, etc. Great, thank you. Um, we do have uh, another comment here from Alexander um, about Bizarria. Um, I think this is an example about how um, WASH and nutrition approaches have contributed to schistosomiasis or, or Bilzaria, um, letting the, the village themselves lead the process. So that's very interesting, thank you. I think we're running out of time, so um, I'm going to end the discussion now, and if there are some further comments or questions, uh, we do have a thread on the Susanna Forum open right now um, about this webinar, so you can go there and you can ask uh, further questions and the presenters uh, can post there, or anyone else can post there to continue the discussion. Um, so I just want to thank um, all the presenters today for your, your very interesting presentations and for the participants for attending today. Um, and we hope to see you at another monthly webinar series um, in the near future. Thanks very much for coming.